Hello, everyone. Today, the bookworms are going to be reading "Freak the Mighty" by Rodman Philbrick, Part Four, Chapter Eight: Dinosaur Brain. It turned out to be a cool summer. I figured we'd get in trouble for running into the pond. It looked bad for a while when the cops drove us home, and I got out all soaking wet and covered with gook. And when Grim was hosing me down, he had this really pruny look on his face, like he was smelling something bad. But the cops made out like I was a hero or something, rescuing the poor crippled midget. So Grim listens to the cops, and then he gives me this weird look, like imagine my surprise. And he goes in the house, and then Grim comes running out in her nightgown with this big fluffy towel, and she really makes a fuss. Me rescuing freak? What a joke, right? Except that's how I must have looked from a distance, because they never knew it was Freak who rescued me, or his genius brain in my big dumb body. Graham is there rubbing me with the towel, and her hands are shaking, and she's saying, "Oh, I saw those blue lights, and I thought the worst." And Graham is behind her, looking at me real intense and shaking his head, and he's saying, "Who'd a thunk it, Mabel?" Which is some kind of joke because Graham's name isn't Mabel. Anyhow. They take me inside, and the first thing Graham does is give me a bowl of ice cream. And Grim, he keeps shaking his head, and he goes, "What this young man needs is a cup of coffee, real coffee." And then he gets busy putting the filter in the machine and measuring out the coffee, and standing by while it drips through. And he's got this stern look, like he's thinking deep thoughts. By the time I polish off the ice cream, Grim is handing me coffee in a china cup from the set they never use. He gives me that cup like it's a really big deal. Maybe because I'm not allowed to drink coffee yet, and he's so grim-like and serious. I open my mouth to say, "What's the big deal? You really think this is my first cup of coffee?" Yeah, right. And something happens, and the words come out. Thank you, sir. And it's like I'm possessed or something. I've no idea where the things I'm saying are coming from or why. I go, "Thanks for the towel, Graham, and the ice cream. Could I have a sugar in the coffee? Two teaspoons, please." And Grim claps his hand together and he says, "Of course you can, son." And it's like, whoa, because he never calls me that. Always Max or Maxwell or that boy. Next thing, he's clearing his throat and coughing into his fist. And Grim is looking at the two of us, and she gets this Graham-like glow, like this is how it's supposed to be, the way things always happen on the Wonder Years. With the family getting all gooey and sentimental about some numb thing the bratty kid did while he's having all his wonderful years or whatever, Graham says, "I want you to promise me something, Maxwell dear. Promise me you'll keep away from the hoodlum boy and his awful friends. Nobody got hurt this time, but I shudder to think what might have happened." And Graham, bless his pointed little head, he goes, "Maxwell can handle himself, can't you, uh, Max?" Right. Uh, Max, not son, which is okay by me. I can run. I say to Graham. I see Tony D. That's what I'll do. Good boy, Graham says. I thought because you're so much bigger than he is, well, you just do that, dear. You run away. He's not running away. Graham says, real impatient. He's taking evasive action, avoiding a confrontation. That's a very different thing, right, Max? I nod and drink my coffee without slurping, and decide it's better not to mention that Tony D carries a knife and he's probably got guns. Because then Graham would only worry, and she's such a clunker when she's worried. Like I said, it turns out to be a pretty cool summer. Usually, what I do is just hang around and look at my comic books and watch the tube, or go shopping with Graham if she really makes a fuss. I I hate the beach because the beach is stupid. The cool crowd looking sleek and tanned and Aren't we gorgeous? And because if you saw me lying on a blanket, you'd go, "Hey, why is that albino walrus wearing sunglasses?" So mostly, I just vegetate in the basement and pick my navel. To quote Grim, Mister Bellybutton lit himself. Freak changes all that. Each and every morning, the little dude humps himself over and he bangs on the bulkhead. Wonka, wonka, wonka. He may be small, but he sure is noisy. Get out of bed, you lazy beast. There are fair maidens to rescue, dragons to slay, which is what he says every single morning. Exactly the same thing, until it's like he's of the alarm clock. And as soon as I hear the wonka 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 of him beating the bulkhead, I know what's coming next. Fair maidens and dragons, and freak with that wake up the world grin of his going. Hurry up with the cereal! How can you eat that much, you big ox? Come on, let's do something. 
He's so full of ever-ready energy. You can practically hear his brain humming, and he can never sit still. Ants in the pants, I say one morning when he's ready to yank the cereal bowl off the table. He's in such a hurry to do something, and he goes, "What?" And I go, "You must have ants in your pants." And he gets this funny look, and he goes, "That's what the fair Gwen always says." Did she tell you to say that? And I shake my head and finish the cereal real slow. And Freak goes, "For your information, there are two thousand two hundred and forty-seven known subspecies of hymenopteran insects." Latin name for misidy, and none of them are in my pants, which cracks me up. Even though I don't understand a word he's saying, I propose a quest. He says, "We shall journey far to the east and see what lies there." By now I know what a quest is because Freak has explained the whole deal. How it started with King Arthur trying to keep all his knights busy by making them do things that proved how strong and brave and smart they were, or sometimes how totally numb. Because how else can you explain dudes running around inside the big clunky tin cans and praying all the time? Which I don't mention to Frigg because he's very sensitive about knights and quests and secret meanings. Like how dragon isn't really just a big slimy fire breathing monster; it's a symbol of nature or something. A dragon is fear of the natural world, Frigg says, an archetype of the unknown. I go, what's an archetype? And Frigg sighs. And shakes his head and reaches into his knapsack for his dictionary. This is true. He really does keep a dictionary in his knapsack. It's his favorite book, and he pulls it out like Arnold Schwarzenegger pulling out a machine gun or something. That's the fierce look he gets with a book in his hands. Go on, he says, making me take the book. Look it up. And now I wish I hadn't said anything about this archetype, dude, because I hate looking up stuff in his stupid dictionary. Start with A, he says. I know that, A R. He says, "Just go along the A's until you come to A R." Yeah, right. Easy for a genius to use the dictionary since he already knows how to spell the words. And R's never look like backward E's to freak, which is the way they look to me sometimes, unless I really squint and think about it. Careful, he says. You'll bite off your tongue, and then we'll have to waste the day at the emergency room getting it retached. Microsurgery is such a bore. Did anybody ever tell you that, huh? I say, but I do close my mouth so my tongue doesn't stick out. I'm still looking in the dictionary for archetype, and I'm looking for words that underline with red ink because that's what Freak does the first time he looks up a word. He makes a line under it, and you'd be amazed how many are underlined. There are whole pages like that where he's looked up every single word. Finally, he spelled out all the letters for me, and I find the stupid word. There's nothing about dragons here, I say, squinting hard at the stuff under the word. It just says pattern. So what is it? A sewing type of thing? Freak has this disgusted look, and he takes the dictionary and he goes, "You're hopeless. Pattern is the first definition. I was referring to the second definition, which is much more interesting. A universal symbol or idea in the psyche expressed in dreams or dreamlike images. Like that helps, right?" I'm getting bored with the dictionary, so I pretend to understand, and Freak finally gives up, and he shakes his head and goes, "I don't know why I bother. Dinosaurs had brains the size of a peanut, and they ruled the Earth for a hundred million years." Chapter nine. Life is dangerous, so out we go. It's a habit by now. Freak riding up high on my shoulders and using his little feet to steer me if I forget where we're going. Not that we always know. Freak likes to make things up as he goes along. You think you're just walking down this ordinary sidewalk, but really you're crossing this dangerous bridge, the kind made of vines that hangs high up in the air over a deep canyon. And when Freak makes it up, it seems so real. You're afraid to look down, or you'll get dizzy and fall off the sidewalk. Don't ever look down, he says. Just keep your eyes closed. And then he puts his hands over my eyes and tells me to keep walking straight. One foot, he says. Now the next. I'm fighting to keep my balance, and his hands are making me dizzy. One more step, Freak says. Steady, steady. Now lift up your hoof. I mean your foot. There, we made it. And he takes his hands away, and I see we've crossed the street. Go east, he says. When I get to the end of the block, that way, mighty steed. Yonder lies the east. I go. How do you know which way is east? And then something is glinting in my eye, and Freak is showing me this little compass. 
The official Cub Scout compass? That's a clever disguise, so you don't know how valuable it is, he says. This is actually a rare and valuable artifact passed down for generations. Lancelot used it. So did Sir Gawain, and for the time the Black Knight kept it on a chain next to his heart. I go, so the Black Knight was a Cub Scout, huh? And Freak laughs and says, That way, we go to the east on a secret mission. We walk for miles, way beyond the pond and the playground and the school, and for a while we're going through this really ritzy neighborhood of big white houses and blue swimming pools. Freak keeps saying stuff like, That's the Castle of Avarice, and Yonder lies the bloated moat. And when we go under trees, he'll say, proceed with caution, or all clear, depending on how low the branches come down. We must be east, I say. Have we got to yonder yet? Because my stupid feet are getting sore. But Freak pats me on the head and says, yonder always lies over the next horizon. You could look it up if you don't believe me. Oh, I believe you. On and on, block after block. Through all these neighborhoods that Freak says are really secret kingdoms, I'll bet we've gone ten miles at least, because my legs think it's a hundred, and even as light as Freak is, he's starting to feel heavy. We're almost there, he says. Turn at the end of the block. Where is it we're going? You'll see, he says, and you will be amazed. Ahead there's this busy intersection, cars whizzing by, and it all seems sort of familiar. Can we stop for a Coke? I say. Groom gave me a dollar. Big deal, but we can split it. Freak goes, Then that shall be your reward, faithful steed. Tinted sucrose and bubbles of air. Onward, onward to the fortress. It turns out the fortress looks like part of a hospital, which it is. The regular hospital is around in front, and there's this new building added out on back. Medical research, it says over the door, and I know because I made Freak spell it out. Does that mean they do experiments and stuff? Freak says, indeed they do. What kind of experiments? I ask. Can you keep a secret? He says. Do you swear on your honor? Sure, on my honor. Freak is really excited. He's shifting around on my shoulder so much, I'm afraid he'll fall off. That's not good enough, he says. You need to swear by blood. You mean like, cut myself? Well, no, he says. And you can tell he's thinking about it real hard. An actual incision is not necessary. It's the same thing if you just spit on your hand. Huh? Saliva is like blood without red, he says. Do as I say, spit on your hand. So I spit in my hand, just a little drop. But Freak says it doesn't matter how much. A single molecule would work because it's the principle of the thing. Now put your hand over your heart, he says. I put my hand over my heart. Now swear on your heart that the data you are about to receive will be divulged to no one. I swear. Freak bends down and he's got his hand cupped around my ear and he's whispering. Inside the research building is a secret laboratory called the Experimental Bionics Unit. The unit's mission is to develop a new form of bionic robot for human modification. What's that? I say, shh, speak of this to no one. But at some future time, as yet under to determine, I will enter the lab and become the first bionically improved human. I still don't know what it means, I say. Bionics, and please don't make me look it up in the dictionary. Bionics, Freak says, that's the science of designing replacement parts for the human body. You mean like mechanical arms and legs? That's ancient history, Freak says. The bionics unit is building a whole new body just my size. Yeah, what will it look like? A robot? A human robot, Freak says. Also, it will look a lot like me, only enlarged and improved. Yeah, right, I say. Let's go home. My feet are tired. Freak tugs hard at my hair. True, he says, with his voice getting high and excited. I've been in there, in the special unit. I have to go every few months for tests. They've taken my measurements, analyzed my blood, and metabolic rates. They've monitored my cardiac rhythms and my respiratory functions, I've already been x-rayed and CAT scanned and sonogrammed. They're fitting me for a bionic transplant. I'm going to be the first. I can tell he really means it. This isn't a pretend quest or making houses into castles or swimming pools into moats. This is why we came here, so Freak could show me where he's been. The place is important to him. I understand this much. 
Even if I still don't understand about bionics or what it means to be a human robot. Will it hurt? I ask, getting your parts replaced. Freak doesn't answer for a while, and then he says in a stern, smart voice, Sure it will hurt, but so what? Pain is just a state of mind. You can think your way out of anything, even pain. I'm pretty worried about the whole deal, and I go, But why do you want to be the first? Can't someone else be first? Isn't it dangerous? Life is dangerous, Freak says, and you can tell he's thought a lot about this. After a while, he kicks me with his little feet and says, Home. That's it for today, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed. For more read-alongs like these, don't forget to subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, give it a big thumbs up and share it with a friend. Don't forget to join us tomorrow for the next part of this book. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!